um, you're trying to develop the standard in R. R is like a statistical language, right? I think. Yeah, that's quite true. What they've done recently is they added an application framework. It's called Shiny, mm. which is a front end mainly used for dashboarding. Mm -hmm. And then they also started looking at um, an API. I think it's Plumber is the uh, the framework. Plumber, so okay. yeah, it's it's for analytics, but they are moving into the territory of applications. So yeah. Nice, nice. Hey, Christo, how are you? Hi, hello, son. So, so Christo, I just met Felipe. I mean, he's been in our channel f for a while, but he's trying to, um, uh, he's trying to write the standard in R programming language, right? Okay, yeah. So he's he's preparing something. He said, "Hey, can I just listen in and join you guys?" Felipe, where are you from originally? I'm also from South Africa. Oh my God, <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> no, I live in I live in Germany at the moment, um, but yeah, from South Africa. Wow, I have all the Bavana Bavanas in here, you know, all the <laughs> boy boys, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, I'll tell you this much: I like I I like uh, I know a lot of people from South Africa. You know, uh, there's this guy, you, you guys might not have heard of him, but he's causing, a, you know, a big, big, you know, noise in the media. He's changing the world every day. His name is Elon Musk. I think oh. he's from South Africa, too. Yeah. <laughs> he was he was born there, but I think he left pretty early. Yeah, yeah, he was born there. He was born there. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's, he, you know, he's he's doing all kinds of things. You know, he's he's, he's what happens when you have an engineer. You know, with with enough opportunity to kind of do exactly what they want to do, maybe he'll do something great. I I think his I think his uh his the one thing that is mainstream is Starlink and Tesla, and they think they're doing just fine. You know, it's not perfect, but it's doing just fine. Hey, Dennis, how are you? Long time, hey, my guys. friend. <laughs> oh, I'm making an appearance. Okay, it's good to see you, man. <laughs> I, have a, I have a meeting in five minutes, so this is just a quick hello. Yeah, right. sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. What's All right. the topic? What's the topic? Oh, Christo has been doing a lot of research. So think about Chris as like the R and D of the standard community. He just goes and tries to kind of push the standard to different kind of uh, corners, different realms of of software development. One of the things that we're kind of thinking about is how do we simplify tracing? You know, and how do can we incorporate that? as part of the uh, software that we build but today he has a he has a new thing he has a a retry you know kind of pattern that he wants to kind of demo and uh, I'm, i'll just sit here and watch and see what he cool. has to say <laughs> all right quickly yeah. share my screen yeah Here we go. Okay. Cool. So, I've I've actually got two things that I I sort of want to show. I've I've um. Oh, the shared up, validations. That's right. Yeah, I've 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 caught up over the, the last week uh, on Discord and seeing all the things that's planned for 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 the next iteration for um, the standard. So I had a play with it myself. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, I changed the validation a little bit. I don't know if you can see the screen now. So this is what we. We used to have in, yep, oh, it's going the wrong way, in in in, in the validation. And um, one thing that I I noticed um, playing with uh, all this is that um, if different people work on the same foundation service, you you can sometimes get that the validation rules for um, add an update um, is, is getting out of sync. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, what I did is um, I moved. Uh, all that validation into a, a shared validation uh, nice. method. Yeah. Um, and and the, the benefit for me in that is one that you, you don't repeat um, the same structural validation across your um, different operations. That's right. And if, if, if you did work with somebody um, and, and they made a change on, say, the add, and the mm -hmm. same change wasn't done on, on the modify, mm -hmm. um, just because you added the validation rule will then trip up your, your unit test on um, the, the, the modify method. 
That's right. So, so That's I, right. I quite like that. Um, yeah. and, and to do that, um, I, I basically created uh, this method that mm. um, you can pass an innumerable and then I extended the, um, the validate function. So basically uh, concatenating the innumerable um, shared list mm -hmm. with any, any, any logical validations that you would then still add in your normal way. Um, and that then calls into uh, validate, which, which was a normal validation routine. So it's just, just a little bit different. Um, yeah. And then uh, I also saw on the blog post that, that you guys are considering doing the same sort of validation on um, the get. Yeah. So um, I updated that and with, with that um, uh, on the uh, I wanted to do my keyboard's not behaving. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just added that function in there. So after we've retrieved the student, um, I can validate and I, I basically call that shared validation for the structure. Oh, so you're talking about, yeah, you're talking about the duplex validation, like the way back, you know, that, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. So, so just, just for people in this, in this uh, channel and also the folks who will be watching this video, you know, I've been kind of, socializing the idea of duplex validation so you're validating in and you're validating out what that basically means is that if someone goes and monkeys with the database and changes the data in there you know and your api is supposed to serve that data we're supposed to be validating this data before it goes out to the customer and if the data doesn't match our validation rules we throw a corrupted data uh, exception that basically we go and say hey there is a corruption that happened in your data source and the data that we're trying to serve to you does not fit our rules anymore. Of course, it brings in some even more interesting scenarios like what happens when you change your validation rules? Is it retroactive? You know, what happens to the data that passed in and were persisted while you had previous rules of validations? It kind of lends itself to, you know, uh, the scenario of, okay, if you're going to change your validation rule, you have to sanitize your data. Otherwise, your API is not going to serve that data because you changed the rules. So I, I'm, I'm, I am personally excited about this because this is actually an easy problem. It's a lot of effort, but it's an easy problem to solve. And I think, you know, what, what you just did, Chris is, uh, is, is quite amazing. The only, the only difference is with the duplex validation, when you're validating on the way out, it's the rules are reversed, especially for dates and stuff like that. Like you don't want the created date to be recent. If it is recent, yeah. you throw the exception. You don't want the, uh, you know, your created date and updated date are supposed to be the same on retrieve. You know, you, you know, what if what if it's updated? What if there is a difference? You you kind of your rules change a tiny bit, but yeah, I, I see what you're going with here. Yeah. So, uh, so, so any any of the logical validations is excluded. So um, nice. you basically on your shared validation, I'm I'm basically just validate that my entity is. Uh, is valid and that it contains all the required fields. So yeah. um, all, all that logical validation still sits in the same place. So if yeah. we look at the shared validation, um, I just basically check if, 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 if I've got a date, um, just, just basically to satisfy the, the required criteria. So nice. Um, nice. I didn't move any of that because also between add and update, your, your, your date validation is slightly different as well. So, so right. those rules are still sitting in the bottom and also you can see there there's the um is not recent is also sitting outside of the shared validation right so so let me ask you this if you go into the shared validations method and have it return just an array an array of rule and parameter instead of i enumerable yeah what, what would that look like if you go and do that the reason why i'm doing this is because i'm trying to get rid of the extra function that flattens out this I enumerable for you, yeah. you know, so, oh, you could just at the semicolon, just say to array and that should do yeah. it for you. To array. Yep. Yeah. So now if you take this as is and put it in the validate, is this validate method, the same validate method that has the business rules engine? I think it should. Uh, let me just comment that one out and then we can have a look. Yeah, let's see. So this is the yeah, but I added. 
let's see it should technically ah it's not working i can see already the red uh, yeah. yeah that's because so, the one is a, a params and um it, it, it's not the same data so i've yeah. seen the uh innumerable uh, or array and then uh, the individual items yeah so so there's a couple of things here um if you don't mind chris would you zoom in a little bit because people watch this on their phones more than they want i know google tells yeah. me everything youtube <laughs> youtube goes and says hey here's the percentage of the people where they're from what they're using how did they get to your channel that's crazy like they know the source where you came yeah. from if you came from google and all that but anyway um the there's a couple of things in here. First of all, we need to figure out a way, like you and I discussed this, you know, a while back, you know, we need to maintain a consistent pattern, right? So it always needs to be rule parameter, rule parameter, instead of doing, you know, uh, two different parameters in here. This is something, yeah. to, so to, to think around this a little bit, instead of having a function that flattens out your I enumerable, we could probably just have another how do we do this, Chris? We need another thing that looks like the rule parameter, except that it's saying rules, yeah. you know, but I, I, okay, let me, let me, uh, I'll take your okay. screen for Quick a second. Question. What's, what's the reason for flattening out the iron numerable? Because, because your business rules engine, your validate wants, wants a, a list of rules, right? You want to pass in an array of rules. So, he he said hey how come we have shared rules we don't want to repeat them so i want to put them in one method and this method is shared between the add and modify like between the add and modify some rules stay the same uh then it's like things like the id is not supposed to be empty the uh the string is not supposed to be null empty or white space and so on and so forth so 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 where christo is coming from here is very strong because he's basically saying why are like I don't want to have these same rules? Can I, can I kind of, you know, lump them up together somehow? Um, yeah, but why are you flattening out the innumerable into an array? What's the reason? Because so so Christo, if you scroll down to the validate, so we want this validate function to be able to process them all the way down to the yeah this validate function. Okay, it's already consuming an array at some point. Is that yeah, array. Okay. Yeah. See? So So anyway, so so here's what I'm here's what I'm thinking. Like, okay, Crystal, here's here's a thought. You know, and you know, like I said, like this works, but we want it to be beautiful so it's easy to remember. That's that's the thing about engineers so they don't have to be looking around saying what should I do now. So imagine if a world where we can do this. So you have rule and you say is recent like this and you're saying student dot created date like that and then maybe you have a parameter and this parameter is name of a student dot created date like this by the way we have another problem <laughs> about this part but we, we we can talk about this later i wonder if we can do something like this rules Right, and that's where you pass in your shared uh, student rules, validation rules. You're not passing any parameters in here. See, I'm not breaking yeah. the structure. But then what do you put here? Like, what do you say in this area? Because you want to maintain that structure. It's easy on the eye. It consumes a lot less of your cognitive resources to have a code that's consistent and follows a certain pattern right and that's the pretty part that i care about so yeah um i know what you mean i, th I think for me I, I did not spend too much time on that because i i see the uh, these bits of validation as separate things so i yeah. see i see that first first one as structural validation and it, not, it looks nice and consistent in there yeah and then you move on to your logical validation yeah um so they all nice and together um and then i just concatenate them before i move to the engine and then uh, your um, external validation is also separate to this then i wonder so now that you're mentioning this i wonder that and and just for for the folks that joining this session for the first time this is literally a brainstorming session we're basically going and saying how far can i take the standard how can i make it better like this is a continuous 
I want to make this better all the time. It doesn't stop, right? So, so another thing w- was that why, Crystal, you you told me the other day, like I want to pass in structural validations, and then you want to pass in your logical validations, and then maybe external validations. Yeah, but they they, they happen slightly different sequences so i don't think you can put them in the same validate function yep. like that that was that was my other argument so, so a stupid question so are structural validations coming from the model and logical validations are coming from the business logic or what what is that yeah yeah so they're all technically like structural validation is when you go and say you have a name right if if this name is it null empty or white space that's a structural validation. It doesn't care about the content. It just says structurally, is this valid, right? Are you, if you're passing in a date of birth, right? Sorry, not a date of birth. If you're passing in an ID and this ID is is empty, like all zeros for a good, that's structurally invalid, right? But then you have the other, the other part, this is structural, structural, uh, like that. But then there's also a different type, which is the logical validation. Logical validations, as I as I think of them and describe them, is basically when you go and say name is not or, or date of birth, for instance, date of birth cannot be, yeah. you know, less than 20 years old. Okay, that's yeah. logical. You're basically exactly. saying, yeah. So so the so the date is correct structurally. It's perfect, right? 19, you know, yeah. 99 or something, but it's not and then there is external validation when you go and say does this student id match you know another id in an external system that we're working with so this is when we go and say it, you know go and on modify we basically go and say go find this object in the database and make sure it exists first before we try to attempt and update it right okay so interesting so for the external rules mm. it's just i mean it's just basically a string just, representing rules from the external server, but yep, it's a remote structural or logical, basically. Uh-huh. It's it's a remote structural or logical validations. But anyway, like yeah. th- there's there's some there's some nuance to this. Like there are there are places where they kind of mold in together. Like you're doing structural, but it's actually logical. Like there are places where you go and say, well, you know, I want my ID not to be empty but also this particular id is reserved like ip addresses for instance are reserved for certain countries right so you're talk are you talking about the structure are you talking about the logic of this ip you know it kind of molds in together in some scenarios but anyway the 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 bottom line is you know um i i could talk about validations for hours but you know the bottom line here is that we can present them this way but this here takes away the engineer's ability to run the validation in a certain order, which is also a problem. I want the engineers to be able to kind of put in the rules in however structure they want. Go ahead. So why don't you break this up into a fluid fluid syntax? Fluid syntax. Like you go and say validate student or student student dot id is invalid something like this and then you go and say for that just something that comes off the top of my head student name you know is invalid stuff like that is that what you're trying to well so but you can break down instead of instead of stuffing all these parameters in the validate method you can break this up into validate structure structural valid structure validate structure mm-hmm. dot dot whatever parameters you need to pass uh, validate logic uh, uh, so that that the break the, the validate part up into a fluent oh so you're basically uh, say <clears throat> val- validate students and then you go and say uh, for a, a stru- structural validation struct structural yeah. validation whatever whatever you want to name the method but they they just chain together and then, then the engineer can choose the order as you just mentioned Mm. and the and the uh length of the chain there may be uh you know other libraries following following this pattern that he's that he's implemented himself and he wants to add to this to the chain 
you can do that. It becomes middleware at that point. So this is this this might look great, but would would engineers be able to remember like implementing this, allowing this to actually uh, well, like this is the culture? It, this is the modern culture for most C sharp developers now. They're very familiar with fluent fluent design because it's pervasive throughout .NET now, especially in ASP.NET Core. No, no, no. I mean, like, you're going to have to go at the bottom of your class and kind of implement, you know, your validate right method. And then you're going to have to go and create maybe a, um, a, a an extension. So that's validation extension. <clears throat> right. Right. Well, I'm order... assuming that's going to be part of your library, though, right? This is just going to be on tap for the developer through whatever library you're creating here. And with extension, with their ability to extend their own validators, you know, at we're will. But. Yeah, we're trying to keep away as much as possible. There's still some issues with it, but we're trying to keep away third parties library third third party libraries from leaking into your business logic. It's supposed to be abstract. It's supposed to be local local models only that you're working with. Of course, right. this is uh -huh. right. I see. I, hear, I see what you're saying. So all of this is is, is implemented by the by the developer himself, herself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. There's also another aspect. Like we do this intentionally, so engineers know actually how to build end to end. But at the at the same time, I can take that abstract logic, and I mm -hmm. can hook up whatever dependencies I want to it. So gotcha. I'm not. You see what I'm saying? Yep. 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 Okay. Yeah. It's 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 just a bunch of like bunch of principles that we're trying to stay true to, so we don't we don't end up in a situation where, right. You know, so here's my here's my opinion, Hassan. I think yeah. this this part this validate thing up here with structural validations, logical external that looks brittle to me. Uh, uh, the third yeah, part of yeah, this guy, it's yeah. Brittle to me. It, it doesn't look, it doesn't match the or the current modern culture, which is fluent design. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> that's yeah. my two cents um yeah i have yeah. a meeting i have to go to i know I, I know thanks thank you dennis see you later okay so let's see here chris this is interesting so so chris what do you think about this part oh you're on mute go ahead Why can't we hear you? What happened? <laughs> Felipe, are you able to hear Christo? Oh, you're on mute too. <laughs> Everyone is on mute. <laughs> I can hear you, Christo. Uh, oh, he had. He, yeah, he had to. He, yeah, he had to kind of drop. Do you have any thoughts about this part here? We're basically. I, I kind of like the fluent idea as well, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, only here. reason for that is I think about when I'm porting it across. Yeah. That syntax is much easier to implement in a in a more uh, how would I call it mm. <laughs> less sophisticated language, you know. Yeah, yeah. In in that particular structure for for uh, fluent validations. Yeah. 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 Christo, are you still with us? No, I can't hear you. Can't <laughs> what hear happened? You. No. <laughs> so so hold on. Go to settings in the stream yard and see if you can uh uh Okay, while Chris is trying to fix this. Yeah, I also yeah, have I'll another question question yeah. Jay, or some. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> so obviously if you in your validation service, mm -hmm. I was just thinking what you said about the duplex. Mm. So I do know that um in addition to passing the, in a web API, in addition to passing the models across the wire, mm -hmm. they sometimes do add extra elements in the header of the mm -hmm. request. For example, an e tag header, mm -hmm. which also is used for sometimes validation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you foresee uh, testing that kind of validation as well, because it might be that, as you said, somebody changes the uh, the database, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But I think this whole idea of adding this e-tag is getting around that because it tells the client, no, it doesn't match the e-tag. Therefore, you need to do another request. Do you understand where I'm going to yeah, go? Yeah, 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 I hear you. So e-tags sit in the header of the request itself, right? Right, right. Somehow, yeah. somehow we're going to need to communicate that out to the service that's consuming from that broker. Like, you know, whatever broker is calling the API, you know, somehow we need to, it could be a middleware or a layer that's on top of the controllers, or it could be, uh, let's see, so you have your OData context. See there, I got just to send you yeah. two examples: one with optimistic and currency enabled, and one with not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, you know, I would try to kind of so so services understand models. So if right, you yeah. want to include that, then it's you're gonna have to incorporate it somehow into your model. You're gonna have to figure out a way, and that's that would be the challenge for all of us. Um, uh, you're going to have to figure out a way where we can basically go and say, how can I make this part of the request that's coming in, right? Somehow, right? The controller going to have to serve that and the API that's calling that is going to have to serve us back somehow, right? That would be my first kind of impression about solving a problem like that. So, so think about it. It's coming in the header, but services don't understand headers. They don't have headers, right. but they do understand models. So if we want to speak their language, we're going to have to include something like that in, in the request that's coming in, in the model that's coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I think they do is they actually use the primary key and then they um, do like a kind of a encryption on that. And uh, like a, they encode some value. Is that what? Uh, interesting. A base 64 value that they actually, so if you look at that response I sent the e tag, that w forward slash, that is a base 64 encrypted value of the version. Yep, let me show people what you shared. So let me do this. Yes. So you have this is the metadata, you have your ID on the yes. entity. That's okay. without the optimistic concurrency enabled. Yeah, and then you have the. Yeah. Let's try this name to see OData e tag. There and it what is. is. What is interesting there is that value there is a base 64 encoded value of the version, mm. which you see at the bottom. And that is generated by Entity Framework when you add the timestamp mm -hmm. attribute. Yeah, if it can be included, I mean, if it can be a part of the model, then that's great. Like without having to to restructure your method to do something special for some parameter, because at the end of the day, it would be a property. Yeah, I, I can get behind that, Felipe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's for a for another day. I mean, that's not really core to the validation. But just thinking to keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if Christo fixed his mic. <laughs> Christo, no. no. <laughs> you, it's it's really important that your mic works. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, okay, so I don't know why his mic is not working. Uh, this is the first time this happens. Okay. Maybe I can do something on my side. The only thing the only thing I have is edit mic settings. Ooh, I can edit his mic settings. Automatically adjust mic volume echo cancellation. Nope. That's all I can do. Also, I can mute and unmute. Say something, Christo, now. Nothing. Damn. <laughs> I was hoping <laughs> I was hoping to hear his two cents on this e tag thing, but Anyway, I, I I don't know. Uh, Chris, do you have a different headset or something? Maybe. What up, Wardy? Hey, Paul. Hey, guys. How's it hey. going? We're, we're, we're trying to fix Chris's microphone. What's Chris done now? It's always <laughs> <laughs> He 
he changed the validation structure of the standard and then <laughs> so so paul let me ask you this we were just talking about um validation rules right and that's cool yeah so cristo has this idea of going and saying i want to pass a bunch of rules you know the shared rules across multiple entities so for yeah. for for add and modify you kind of have some shared rules that you do for both structural validations right yet for instance if you have a student coming in whether it's an add on modify the id this is interesting because i was wondering about turning um validations into like a support broker type function yeah so you could farm it off and then the support broker would figure out what the set of rules are and then apply the correct ones to the objects being sent in so you can have like a generic validator but this is probably yeah. a, a lot better because it keeps it in context, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, where do the rules actually come from, though? That's my only question. Like, do we have some sort of rule provider that we can pass in? He he created um, uh, he created an I enumerable, you know, of that. So he created an I enumerable. What's yeah. what's happening in the back? Okay, let me try to vo okay, do back. Hold on, hold on. Sorry, I got noise in the background. Let's see. Uh, echo cancellation. Yeah. So here's here's Christo's implementation. He basically created a a shared validations that returns basically an array or I enumerable of of rules, and he's basically using them in the validate method. See what he did? Yeah, that's cool. Sweet. See, the way I used to do validations was mm. I created an object extension and I used the data annotation stuff. So I could just say object.validate and the object mm. would validate itself. But obviously that doesn't fit the standard. But it yeah. was really clean in line because in my service, I could just take in, say, a student. I could say student.validate. And if it didn't throw an exception, I knew it was valid. Mm. <laughs> mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I so so Christo, I know you can't I know you can't speak or you can speak, but you know your voice isn't coming through. But the one thing that I wanna just press on is just two challenges that we have with this. We need to maintain structure somehow. We need to maintain structure. Like like the only problem that I have with this is basically there are some parameters that have one form of structure, like rule and then a parameter, and then we have others that are just a method that we're passing in. We need to figure this out. The thing about, just so you, just so you guys know, you know, Crystal will figure out the get it to work part and get it right part. I try to get it pretty. I just make it look easy to remember. And that's what these discussions are all about. This is a series called the standard discussions where we, base, it's basically R&D for the standard. Um, um, Like, like me with Odata. I solve the problem. You make it look good. <laughs> <laughs> very much very much the rest of the tech industry. You know, people will come and be like, Hassan, is this standard compliant? I'll be like, it looks ugly. I don't know what to do with it, but I need to fix it. You know, so, but so uh, clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just trying to make so so I'm trying to make programming languages especially if you're using something nice like c sharp you know definitely not go definitely not go but um, if you're using something like this i want it to feel natural right like an extension of you like you're basically you know communicating with the computer but you don't have to kind of bend bend your head backwards you don't have to twist your brain just to kind of figure out how to express a certain idea by the way just so you guys understand the newcomers a uh, uh, channel in the standard it's basically a bunch of interns in my startup and these folks um you know the way i'm teaching them programming is very very new something i'm experimenting with which is basically to go and say here's your homework today pick up a random sentence from the news and try to translate that into c sharp what would that look like nice. so it kind of it builds up that muscle of you know can you actually translate ideas into code and then pick up the code and translate it back into ideas. That kind of muscle, I think, is extremely important for our uh, for our industry. If you can't express yourself in a proper way, how am I supposed to 
uh, be able to teach you something as advanced as cul-de-sac or lake house or you know any of these advanced concepts right um so so anyway i think this is just a topic for people to kind of think about i there is also some i think Krista also has something about retry Krista, can you navigate to your retry logic real quick it's breaking my heart that i can't hear him but uh he has code. <laughs> Watch this, Paul. Oh, that's fancy. What does with retry do? It retries. <laughs> it, so it literally what? Does it try and... Oh, so, okay, in a loop. Try it's, it. Catch any exception. Try it again. It, it's going to need a little bit of cleanup, but uh, uh, he's like the structure is not bad at all. I love it. He's basically going and saying... Interesting. It's, it's going to need a little bit of work. Like, but... Uh, I think I think we could use poly and put it behind a broker, Paul. Isn't poly what they use for retries? Yeah, yeah. Never you could heard use. It. You never heard of poly? No. Dude. Then to be fair, I I don't write retry logic like. Ever. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> because your systems work the first time always. Yeah. Well, well, what I tend to do is like in the event of an exception that I can't control, I bomb out. I log what the problem was, and then essentially later on I retry the operation again, and I always build into my business logic like if an operation is like half done the business logic will detect that and then complete the bit that's not been done from the half done work, if that makes sense, when I'll fix mm. the problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the right way to go, but it, it feels easier than doing something like retries because, I don't know, just like all hell can break loose with retries because the system has to start assuming things, doesn't it? Yeah. Hang on. It looks like he got a new headset. No, we can't hear you still. Why is that? No, I can Did hear it oh. very faint. Um, hello. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 He switched <laughs> it off and on again. <laughs> what happened? I don't know. <laughs> Man, it's, yeah. it's to hear you. This is the highlight of my day. I am able <laughs> to hear Christo again. Well okay. done, Christo. You're now qualified to join the newcomers channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think um, with this retry, um, I think the main thing was just to, um, so in the in the use case that I had, um, I had to remove some stuff from the file system and the files was always always, always locked. Um, so I, I just created a, a basic loop and then I could also specify a specific exception type to be retried on. So if it doesn't sit in that list of exceptions, then you don't retry on it. So it's not everything that's getting a retry, so any specific things. Nice. Right. Nice. Do you put a delay on the retries? Yeah. Um, so I've I've got a, a time span of uh, three milliseconds at the moment for the unit test, but um, nice. yeah. So um, and we can we can overload this uh, this function as well if you want to pass that in, so you don't have to. But but for this, I just start coded the the retries and the um, time span. I I also just, love. Mm -hmm. I love that you're putting it behind the, the exceptions because it's kind of an extension of the exception. Yeah. You never retry and list something errors out. Why would you yeah. retry if something doesn't? That's beautiful. I love the thought there. Yeah. This also backs up your thought that um, exception handling is a form of flow control to some extent. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's... it's if else, basically. If this exception, if it's this type, it's just a different way. We call it selection. The iteration, selection, and sequencing. That's what a yeah. programming language is. But or that's what I call logic at least. So so Christo, Christo, what do you think about poly? Uh poly is nice, yeah. Um I've used it in the past. I was just playing with this to to localize the, the handling. Yeah. Yep. Um and uh, just a, a lightweight version of, 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 of something that I wanted to um, get get done quickly. But yeah, we can certainly use poly. It's quite a flexible library. Um back on the exception handling um of validation um i think we said we can potentially also move the validation in engine external yeah and then just 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 have the validation rules in in that validation um parcel file right so i think that's the other thing that we we we, we debated on a while ago when we uh, discussed the, the validation rules uh, right right potential changes on that so that you uh, in effect, get a validation broker. 
um, right. so that you don't have to uh, duplicate that uh, validation class over every um, because there's a lot of repetition in, in this as well. So, so, so here's, so I'm having a bigger problem now because, you know, extending, I'm going to take your screen for a second, uh, Christo, if that's okay. Um, the, I, I still want our business logic, like our methods, like right now we're in this situation where we have, actually, let me, let me just open up a project. I always have at least two or three open, which is fun here now we have a little problem because now we're in this situation where let me switch back into file mode so it doesn't bark at me when i start doing errors it really bothers me when it does that so apis services foundations and then you have the let's just pick up efforts for instance so here's now the new problem that we have i don't think our model or the way we represent the code is extensible. And the reason for that is like we did the try catch. Great. Everyone is happy. Everyone goes home. Perfect. But now we have things like with we try. We also want with throttling. I think I misspelled that throttling. And then with check this out with secu with um what is it with tracing? Yeah. So it's not working. I, try, I, try, I tried doing extension method for that, but uh, at the end of the try catch, you're only sitting with a value task of, of effort. Right. So, so, so you don't see what, anything. You don't have what happens. What happens then is if you, if you do want to extend it, you need to go into the exception class. Right. So that you can actually extend the delegate, but then you hide all that, that niceness right. in the exception class, which is. I also, Christo, I also want to be able, like, so so there's this problem with structure it has to look pretty somehow mm -hmm. but also there's this idea that i have where i go and say with security and then i go and define the roles of who can access this yeah so admin only admin only uh operator whatever the case may be so you see the function is its own island self independent it, you can now pick up that module and go sell it to any engineer out there and say, there isn't a lot of bills and whistles that you have to work with. My problem though, is not functional. It's just structural. Like this looks ugly. Even yeah. if I do this, it looks terrible. Yeah. We've got the rollback on there as well. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. With rollbacks. So all of these things need to be implemented, like just for the people that, because someone yesterday, you know, told me this and I wasn't very happy, he said, okay, the standard is perfect. We figured it out. I'm like, no, we're not even close. We're barely scratching the surface. I'm barely trying to make, okay, we did build a lot of enterprise applications according to the standard, but that doesn't mean we should stop, right? The whole idea is to keep trying to enhance this. What, what about instead of passing in something like, um... Uh, a logging broker because you could put with logging on there as well couldn't you yeah yeah you could pass in some yeah, sort that's of with tracing. Um, yeah yeah excuse the terminology because i know you're going to hate it but like a uh, sort of utilitarian or sort of common services type broker that's like common across your entire code base right so we could build that it's like, as like he a... wants to fight with me it's like he's trying to <laughs> yeah, piss yeah. me off <laughs> i know we'll find a better name for it but imagine you've got like this uh, broker that you pass in uh -huh. and you and you do much like your try catch so you'd say that broker dot um you know execute or something and then you right. give it your async function right and internally within the broker and through di or configuration or whatever we add in all of these widths into that but right we do the, we build it as a separate to the standard package so we have lists of services and then through configuration we decide which ones we want to plug in right because then you can plug them in globally essentially or you can have different configurations for different sets of services so you just inject effectively a different type of that helper service sorry <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I, th there's obviously going to be a better name for it right something that like <laughs> it's the standard but 
I mean, what you're talking about here are, are common problems, right, that you're going to have across the entire code base. You want exception handling everywhere. You want logging everywhere. You want rollbacks everywhere. You want throttling everywhere that you do certain types of operations. You know, you mm -hmm. want um, you want security everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, how do you answer these questions without having something that is generic? Mm -hmm. uh, and what I'm saying is whether we like the terminology or not, these things are helper type functions or common functions mm -hmm. in that that's the way that we describe them in English. However, that might not be the term that we want to give to them within the context of the standard, because I've realized that obviously it's bad terminology to use because it encourages bad programming practices. So if we can come up with a better name for it, I do think that we could build these types of functions into a library that we can package as part of our sort of, if you like, recommended set of standard packages. You've already got things like your exceptions, RESTful sense, stuff like that. And we can sort of push these products out and say, look, these are recommended you like utilitarian kind of libraries that mm -hmm. are useful for building good standard compliant code. And then, uh, you know, just, just because these, by the way, I'm not super happy about Pulling, I was just telling Dennis this before he joined in. You know, we had we had another dude in here, and you know, one of the things that I'm not super happy about is pulling in third party libraries because even if I create it, it's still third party and to your application, uh, or even external or even native into your core business logic. So if we do something like that, it's going to have to hide behind some local abstraction layer. It must. It needs to. Right. I think but, I mentioned this to you before, didn't I? Because you were yeah. talking about stuff like RESTful Sense. And I said, yeah. well, to me, that's a third party library, right? Yeah. So although for you, it's an internal thing that you've created, to me, yeah. you know, it's it feels like good practice, but it's yep. still third party. Yeah. So 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 just just hear me out, guys. You know what? Listen, this is how this is how I visualize these services. Just so you guys understand, a service to me is just an object that is 3D. It has multi dimensions, and uh, it it gives me the kind of ability to go and say, okay, this is your object. Let's see here. So this is purposing modeling and simulation. I think it's in here. I'm not wrong. Have you ever heard the term aspect oriented programming? Yeah, of course. And Anders hates it to death because it has a uh, reflection and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Of course. This is what internal mock is, by the way. It's aspect-oriented programming. You're injecting something, you know, into the system on build time. So there is hidden code that you don't see, right? This is why we say partialization. Why partialization is okay? Because you're leaving a trace of something that's happening to your code. When we say try catch, that's a trace. You're basically going and saying, hey, wait a second, there's something else going on there. But aspect-oriented programming, um, the problem is that your code doesn't look like it's doing much, but when you're building your system, it's injecting code. And Anders, they asked Anders about this, and he was like, this is garbage. I'm not going to use that. I'm never yeah. going to use that. I don't know. There, there might be a usage. For, I mean, again, we're using internal mock, right? You know, by the way, if you fixed it, please push a pull request, please, if that's, a, if that's an option. Oh, yeah, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. I still call it locally. This, this is how I see these services, right? It's, you have your logic. That's the most obvious, you know, kind of surface. But everything else is just different aspects of this service, right? So, and this is like, this is just for us as humans to understand, but it's, but it's infinitely multidimensional. Like what, what Christo just did, he said there's exceptions and the exception itself has a dimension called a trace, uh, sorry, retry. Right. So there's that in mind. Right. Um, I'm trying to turn this image into code somehow. OK, and this is going to take a little bit of work and I need your help. I need you to kind of tell me, oh, this is we can get behind this or we can't. Right. Can we actually get behind this? Can we actually make this look something pretty? Because that's not pretty. That's disgusting. I'm not going to look at that. Nobody is. Here's another idea that I have with, and then you include in here a bunch of things like uh, 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 throttling broker, uh, tracing broker, a bunch of things, but it's also horrible. 
right that see that was my theory so you could say with and then you pass in like um you know a utility broker stacks i mean i don't know is it okay to pass in say an i enumerable of support broker and then you can say with this i enumerable of support broker so this if you've got if you've got like a, a throttling support broker, a tracing support broker, a logging support broker, and you've got a, I don't know, a retry support broker, right? Mm -hmm. Those things ultimately behind them are going to have standard compliance services, right? Right. So you can then say, okay, those those things are individually all already to the standard. Now, if I wrap them up and say, okay, they all implement a common interface. They're all um, support broker type functions. Yeah. Right. And then I say dot with and give it that I enumerable, then it can apply them all. Yeah. But then, uh, but then each one of them has to, they have to comply with some interface. So this with function will call that. It will call yeah. that interface. Right. Yeah. But it's, but it's also, oh. So are we standardizing support brokers here? <laughs> But in that previous version, when you have with throttling, with tracing, with logging, why not just drop the with? You just say dot throttle, dot logging, dot trace. Yeah. I kind of like this syntax because it, it it comes back to the point Dennis made earlier about the validation. Almost yeah, like a flu fluent, fluent side. Yeah. Yeah. But, but like see, throttle, but, rollback, mm -hmm. trace, uh, secure. If, if we were just doing standard sort of solid principle end tier stacks, I would say, hey, chuck these things in as attributes on the method, because then you can uh, use. That can there's, there's different ways oh. to sort of do that with. Um, oh, what was it? There was a library I used to use that had like a try catch attribute, mm. and what it would do is at compile time, it would essentially wrap a try catch around the the method essentially so whenever that method got called if it threw any exception it would fall into that try catch so you could put a try catch attribute on there specify a method name and it would call that method and give it the exception yeah similar um, to what you do on controllers when you say security or or roles admin and then yeah, only that. an admin can call that um route yeah so i'm thinking that like all of these support broker type functions are essentially that you know you want to mm. log a call you you put a logging method on it and you put a logging attribute on it and then you specify some parameters but but so, by the by the way to chris's point i think these two like this and this they can be extensions like this this here yeah these two guys they can be extensions of try catch like these two will be be behind mm. try catch because these two cases belong to exceptions. You don't roll back unless something bad happened. You don't just roll back for the funsies of it. But there are yeah. some edge cases where you will want to roll back based on a, a value that you received from the outside world that says, oh, by the way, that student already left the school. So roll back your request to uh, create a library card for them or something like that. Yeah, you sort of want to orchestrate it, don't you? So you want like an orchestrate attribute where you can say orchestrate try catch roll back log trace yeah secure so so anyway i just want to say this like just something for you guys to think about because if we can solve the problem for modularity and extension like like as far as this goes universally everyone that saw this said this is beautiful they don't know how long it took to come up with something like that but this is beautiful if we go and do this, if it's just the one like Christo did, I think it might be okay, but we have many of them, Chris. We have many, many of them. How are we going to do that? We're going to- Yeah, it'll get bloated very quickly. Yeah. I, I don't know what to do, honestly. I'm still thinking, but uh, you know, that's the point of these discussions. And we're almost at the hour. But um, I think we should try at least start with tracing first, Christo, you know, and then 
we're recording these sessions so people know this is where, where our ideas are. But I think we certainly need to start with tracing first. I need to find a way. By the way, we're also working against the language itself here. Like we're pushing C sharp mm -hmm. beyond its own boundaries because we're basically going and saying, I want you to do something in my head that you may not be designed for. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what innovation is. You, you bend technology to your will. You make technology do what you want, not the other way around. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think if we can figure out how that needs to look and find a way to do it in that way, then, then we sort it because tracing in itself, we know is working. Rollback will be uh, easy as well. Uh, um, retry. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know at the moment with the try catch how to do that differently. What if I created like a keyword in C sharp like this? I was just thinking that. Like attempt <laughs> try catch. Yeah, attempt or something like that. Yeah, but then the attribute might be the way to go. The attribute, right? Or on top. Well, um... The reason why I thought of attributes is because with attributes, you can, I can't remember what the term for it is, but there's a term. Where you oh, you mean a decorator? A decorator. A decorator, yeah, that's the word, decorator. Yeah, so you have a decorator, that's it, it's the decorator pattern, right? So what would happen is when this code gets compiled, it would inject and wrap more code around mm. the code that you've got in the method. So for your try catch, yeah, you're basically saying that's the same as the try catch that you've already got. So what I would do in addition to that try catch is I would put brackets and then a method name or a reference to a method that you would give the actual exception to. So you'd still have your try catch method. So mm. you're still explicitly handling it locally in this mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. but you're referencing it in the attributes. So you're saying, hey, I want you to try this, and in the event of an exception, call that try catch method. You could do the same with, um, yeah, a lot of these aspects. And then what we could do is we could follow the existing patterns that you've already established in the standard, right? So you could say yeah. for each of these, let's call them aspects for lack of a better expression, right? Yeah. So try catch goes into a try doc try catch partial. Um, logging goes into a doc, you know, logging partial. That's part of this class, but the methods that handle all of that are just, you know, subs effectively. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way that um, entity framework is going about it with the authorize. I'm just looking at documentation now. You have various attributes. But they, I thought they moved away from that into more fluent yeah. model. Like so the, the, the problem used to be like that. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. The, the problem I found with some of these functions, and security is a classic example here. So in my own experience, I've found that the security check I want to do is an in-context security check, and it might be based on some parameter or something that comes from, say, another broker or from a child service call. So I'm going to ask something, a question, based on the result of that, I want to do a method call on an auth broker to determine if some combination of like the current user that I've probably got from, you know, another call has access to something. Um, so we've got to be aware that like, it's not always going to fit as an attribute because if you need to pass parameters to it in some way, you've got to figure out how to get those parameter values in, which you can't do by attribute, right? Also, which is where this try catch pattern works so well. Yeah. Also the problem here is that, you know, this here is kind of organic to the method that you're working with. This here will require you to create more classes, external or local classes that you're going to be reutilizing. So now you're, you're creating entanglement. If you decide to do it this way. That's my concern. I, I, I like this idea. It's not too bad, but it's not too organic either. Um, that's it, it comes back to that point that you were saying earlier about like you know if we provide these things and then we recommend in the standards that they're used i would say have them as a recommendation but don't have them as a requirement and yeah. there's, there's a lot of like rules that i you know you and i both know that i don't follow the standard in the in the broker layer but there are things that i've done differently I'm and putting you in standard jail. <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're choices that I've made because I've come against uh, situations where I didn't feel that I could nicely fit into the standard the way it's written. And I feel like, like the standard needs 
hard and fast rules that are you must do this and then it needs some optionals like and if you want to implement our best practice we recommend you do this but it's not required as long as you can provide an alternative that also fits the criteria and follows all of the must rules essentially T -t today paul i leave some of these things for interpretation intentionally like you'll see some places in the standard where it's left vague on purpose yeah. right like i don't go tell people things like literally i don't talk about rollbacks right i say hey figure out a way to do it mainly because i don't know the answer too but you know there are places like jokes aside i i, I think that okay another idea just for everyone here what if we did this so this with takes a funk which is what this try catch is and uh secure or security, tracing, and so on. How many can you have? Like if we go and kind of do a a smoke test. Ten. No. That'd be ugly when you draw them all out, though, won't it? But if each of those is a funk. Yeah. Trying to see what it would look like it's not it's not natural it's weird it's yeah. weird anyway just something to think about we have this option we also have this option in here and ceases and then we'll be fluent when it doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah that's that's the thing see the reason why i tell a lot of people go out there and look at you know if if you look at my instagram it's mostly just subscribe to um uh places in scotland where fall where there is fall and stuff like that the reason why i do that on purpose is because i want to see what pretty looks like and then see what it feels like to see pretty and then try to apply that to the programming uh syntax that we have this is literally what i look at people say where do you get your inspiration from i'd be like scotland i'm looking at scotland and i'm saying damn this looks pretty you know and how can I bring that, how can I bring that feeling that I have when I look at something like this into the code that we have, right? How can I make people feel the same way looking at this and writing code, right? Thank God he muted. Oh my God, my head hurts, dude. What do you have going on in the background? How can you Sorry. write it code this way? <laughs> I can't really hear it because I got my headphones in. Of so course. Yeah, you're okay. Anyway, I know I'm pretty sure someone's going to drop a comment on, on YouTube about this. But anyway, I want to bring something that looks as pretty as this in the code base. You know, all of you, and, and this is without a doubt, we can make, make it work, but can we make it pretty? That's the standard that I'm pushing people towards. That's kind of excellence that I'm looking for. And I'm going to try as well. I'm going to throw some ideas. The one thing I want you just to know is that this is beyond just getting the job done. This is not about getting the job done. This is doing something beautiful and interesting. Anyway, Christo, thank you so very much for bringing in this. Please, please keep coming to our uh, standard. Yeah. You know, you are very, very important to this community. I want you to know that. Right. And um, we always uh, need newcomers. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You know, so, so, so just so you guys know, like the standard community at this point in time, it morphed into something that is beyond my wildest dreams because we have newcomers. These are people that just want to learn programming. They have no programming back background, right? These are coming in and they're saying, hey, teach me programming, you know? So imagine, I'm trying to see what it's like if you're being taught programming according to the standard, like you're growing up learning these principles instead of having to go through hell, you know, to actually come to a conclusion where you start decided. I've worked with enough garbage. I want something pretty. Maybe working with garbage is what makes us super adamant on building something clean that we can actually live with. I don't know. So we have the newcomers. And then we have people like Felipe that are coming in and saying, hey, let's do it in R. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> do, you know, do you know how much fire I, I got because of uh, writing Go? Uh, according to the standard with the C-sharp accent. I had a bunch <laughs> of people reach out to me and be like, listen, man, 
<laughs> stay away from go like it's not your thing stay away from it and i'm like because i kept making fun of it and people were like you can't do that right so there's that part and then there's also people in the community like uh, like Etienne. Etienne is saying, I want to bring it into gaming, right? I didn't think about that, right? It's great. And then the translations and so many other things. Um, anyway, it's fun. It's really fun. This is like, this is a part of my life now. This is a thing that I'm trying to kind of give back to the world. Um, uh, Christo, let's meet again uh, on Tuesday. And I'm going to try this weekend at least to find a better way to represent uh tracing tracing is our next highest priority we want to be able to implement tracing i think what you have is great we just need we need to make it pretty hmm. we need to make it look like scotland and fall somehow <laughs> no offense there paul <laughs> 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 that's that's easy. You just need a URL, and you just download the URL straight into the code. <laughs> You're done. You, you, by the way, by the way, just I forgot to tell you this. This is how uh, this is how Go works. There is no libraries. Pictures give of a... Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Go... I don't think it works like that, mate. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Go doesn't have libraries. You basically put the URL of the GitHub repository where the code that you want to pull in in and when you run it goes and pulls that code there's no libraries doesn't node work like that as well no it doesn't node has new new get new packages the npm packages yeah but it's basically the same thing right you put you whack in a git url and it pulls the package you whack in a git url so go language guys i have to drop off yep, um, yep, i'll yep. see you next week thank you so much chris thanks bye Paul, check this out. You just go and you get the URL and that's it. As far as I understand it, again, I'm super ignorant, still trying to learn. I'm, I'm kind of pissing off an entire community, but you basically go and pick up the whole thing. Right? Do we need to get like a Go expert in here? We do. I have Sean Hobbs, but you know, I, I need to find the time to kind of pull him in. Hi, Etienne. Hi. I was just talking about you. We should talk Is about it. A we should talk about a million dollars. Maybe it'll show up. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, sorry, yeah. we're, we're just wrapping up, but uh, you'll be able to see the recording. Um, um, anyway, you know, bottom line, you know, Paul, Felipe, you know, and Etienne, after you watch the recording and Christo, you know, just if and the people watching us, if you can come up with an idea that can make our code pretty, please reach out. You know, this is really important. You know, if we can standardize and simplify coding, we can use that power to build anything in the world. We can do a lot of things mm -hmm. that are very useful for people. Also, just, just for you to know, as members of this community, I'm trying to kind of communicate with uh, charitable and uh, nonprofit organizations to see what kind of software work they want to do. So even the standard compliance systems that we're building is actually going towards an organization that does humanitarian work. So while we're learning and evolving our systems, we're also trying to help the world. We're trying to do something back you know, for people who need help. So anyway, thank you all so very much. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Next time. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.